Hello everybody, and welcome to our first Q&A video. These are questions submitted by our viewers specifically for a Q&A session. I thought this might be a good way to keep some more content coming in between bigger projects, as well as a way to touch base with the community and keep something of a steady line of communication. We have a small handful of questions to answer today, as well as a new project announcement at the end of the video, so stay tuned. Our first question comes from Storm Eagle Gaming. When it comes to Gundam, who is your favorite character and mobile suit? Also, are you looking forward to the new Gundam series? For those who aren't aware, before I started doing mostly Mega Man content, I did post some Gundam videos on occasion. Gundam is one of my favorite anime and game series, so I have a lot to say about it. That being said, however, I will state that most of my knowledge is centered around the Universal Century, primarily the One Year War, the Laws Conflict, and a little bit of the Grips Conflict, as well as G Gundam from the Future Century. But on to the questions. My favorite mobile suit is easy. I've always been partial to the Xeon mobile suits just based on design and abilities, even if I really don't like the Zabi family. My favorite suit has to be the Gelgoog Jaeger. As far as the anime is concerned, it's only appeared so far in 0080 War of the Pocket, as far as I'm aware. But I always liked playing as it in the game and counters in space. It's a beautiful machine. Fast, sturdy, stylish, and its beam rifle can be used for sniping or rapid fire. Simple, yet elegant. As for favorite character, that's a harder one to answer. Each character that I've seen has some good qualities and some bad ones, but it's really hard for me to nail down just a single favorite, primarily because I just don't think that any of them have really resonated with me on a personal level the way several of my other favorite characters have. If I had to mention a few that I have a soft spot for, though, I'd probably say Shiro Amada from the 8th MS team for his development and idealism, going from black and white, we are the good guys, they are the bad guys, to both sides have good people and war brings out the worst in everyone, which is one of the biggest central themes behind the 8th team. I will say that while he and Aina are an adorable couple and have good chemistry, the start of the romance was basically just Romeo and Juliet, and it could have been more fleshed out. But what I like most about him is him prioritizing the survival of his squad over all else. I honestly find that to be the most relatable thing about him. Another character I really like is Ko Uraki from 0083. He wasn't really like a lot of other Protags from the Gundam series, where they got a high and mighty attitude while the majority of the fighting capability came from the mobile suit and not the pilot. Uraki always knew where his skills were, and we constantly see him trying to improve. He has a very lawful good air about him, like how he didn't want to gawk at the candid photos that Monsha took and he put them in the shredder. That's one point I can give him over Shiro. Shiro was creeping on Kiki while she was taking a bath. Come on, dude, she's like 17 and you're in your 20s. Go to jail. I already did a full video on Uraki's romance with Nina, so I'm gonna leave that one alone. On the whole, I think Uraki is a good kid that kinda got shafted from a narrative standpoint. One Xeon pilot I kinda like in an odd way is Anvil Gato, the antagonist of 0083 and Uraki's arch nemesis. I have a video planned to discuss Gato's dynamic as a villain, so I won't say too much here, but what I like about him as a villain is his total dedication to the cause and that he's practically an unstoppable force of nature right up until he's finally eventually just overwhelmed with sheer numbers and firepower. I have several others I could talk about, but it's hard for me to say that just any one character is my favorite because Gundam just has so many likable characters. I will say this though, Alan B. Beardsley is best Gundam waifu. As for the new series, I haven't really looked into it much. I actually kind of fell off of Gundam a while back. It's not that I don't like it anymore, I just haven't really made the time to experience many of the newer works. The most recent thing I've watched has been the Hathaway movie because it's basically a sequel to Shars Counterattack. I don't really know much about the upcoming Gundam Witch from Mercury, but I will definitely give it a look if I get the chance to. So now, let's look at some questions related to Mega Man, because I know that's what the majority of my viewers like. Ryan Darkclaw 643 asks, If they make a new entry to the Battle Network or Star Force timeline, what do you personally want it to be? Story, characters, and gameplay. I never really gave a lot of in-depth thought onto what a new Battle Network game could include, since the series more or less ended on a conclusive note, and a new entry would have to make sure not to mess with canon, unless we wanted to say that Clockman's time travel created an alternate timeline. I have a handful of ideas, but not enough to piece together into a full Battle Network experience. But for a basic overview, I think that the main antagonistic force needs to be the Sigma Virus. We've seen other Mega Man X characters and ideas referenced throughout the series, and this one was practically gift-wrapped for the EXE series, and they did nothing with it. If they don't make the Sigma Virus a sentient Navi, then they could just have it be a very powerful viral force, but they could give it some similarities to Sigma from the X series, like using various avatars to transport and spread the virus, give it a wire frame texture for its body, and so on. For the story setup, after the defeat of the Psybeasts and Dr. Wily becoming reformed, the Professor from Network Transmission returns with Neo World 3 and creates the Sigma Virus from the framework of the original Zero Virus. This would play on the concept from the X series that while the virus didn't originate with Sigma, when Wily's virus merged with his programming, it mutated and became the terror that we know. 
Naturally, Zero would return, this time as an ally and possibly a playable character. I think just to maintain form with the other games in the series, this theoretical Battle Network 7 should also have the same cross system from Battle Network 6, since both BN2 and 3 used Style Change, and BN4 and 5 used Double Soul, so this way, two games would use the Link Navi and cross systems, but Beast Out would be removed. As for other playable characters and navvies, I think it'd be great to see some characters from the previous games return that didn't get enough screen time, like Turbo Man and Ring from Battleship Challenge. They should also definitely bring back Sean and Mamoru from the first half of the series. Sean could even be a Link operator, letting you play as Freeze Man and giving you Freeze Cross. Mamoru would operate Serenade, who would help you out during the story. If we have Zero be a playable character, then I think he should be a version exclusive. He should take a role in the story due to his tie with the Sigma virus, but if they decide to do two versions, like most of the other Battle Network games, then one version should give us Zero as playable and Zero Cross, and the other version would give us Proto Man and Proto Cross. But both games would feature both navvies as a boss. As for what other unique mechanics we could bring to Mega Man, I think that the Sigma virus should play into it somehow. Give it like a corruption aspect kind of thing. Maybe kind of similar to the noise from Star Force 3, as for what it does, I can't really think of anything specific off the top of my head. So yeah, I have some basic ideas, most of which are just tying up loose ends or using underused ideas, but not enough to form an entire game around. As for a Star Force sequel, just give us Star Force 4 the way they had planned to, with Lance Descendant and Geo teaming up to become hackers. I want to see that story. Another one from Ryan Darkclaw 643 What features would you hope for the Battle Network Legacy Collection to either improve the base games or just as cool extras? Do you think that it will have a Rookie Hunter mode like the X and Zero collection? If so, how would it work? As for the Rookie Hunter mode, for those not familiar, the X and Zero ZX Legacy Collection had this feature called Rookie Hunter mode, where it reduced the amount of damage that you took, I've been told that some spikes won't insta-kill you, and you deal more damage to your enemies. How would Battle Network incorporate this? That's a very hard question to answer. I honestly don't think that there needs to be an easy mode for an RPG game, and if they were to come up with one, I would say that it should be more primarily focused around the puzzle mechanics of the game and less on the combat system. Because we have to deal with the overworld as well as the in-battle mechanics, some of the minigames and puzzles and obstacles can be a pain. Think back to Battle Network 1 and Operation Shooting Star. In the remake, they nerfed the power plant stage by giving you a guide beacon to point out where the invisible paths would be because so many people got lost, and once your battery ran out, it became much, much harder to finish the dungeon. So it would be things like that for an easy mode, or a junior net battler mode, I guess. Like, let's take the aquarium stage from Battle Network 6. You know how it's got all those sharks that corner you and jump up and eat your program, and then you have to run all the way back to where the program was to get it back? They could do something like make the sharks move slower so it's easier to outrun, or maybe in the Windman scenario Battle Network 4, they could slow down the tornadoes so that getting by them would be easier. Something like that. Make the overworld puzzles easier, because the in-battle gameplay already isn't super difficult. If you set your folder up right, you can cheese practically every boss in the series. That said, I think that if they incorporated some kind of junior net battler mode, then there would have to be some kind of complex system for when it can activate, and it might have to send you back to the start of the Cyberworld area in order to use it, because the puzzles and obstacle values are changed. For balancing reasons, I think they would have to have you restart the area. Does that, does that make sense? This is an interesting question and idea, but I'm not really sure what the developers might have planned. As for improvements to the base games, honestly, the only thing I could possibly hope for would be better and more accurate translations and possibly uncensored dialogue, if any was censored from the localized versions. Redo Battle Network 4's script. Absolutely. Battle Network 4 and 5 had a ton of spelling and grammar errors, but Battle Network 4 had it the worst. There are a few scattered here and there in the other games, but not nearly as egregious. They could fix a few glitches here or there. There are a few that are pretty game-breaking, especially if you look at the Japanese version of Battle Network 5. There are some soft locks and game crashes you can perform if you try hard enough. They should restore all of the original cut content and give us the e-reader exclusive unlockables. Give us the base battle chip in BN1, duo and grand pre power in BN4, leaders raid and chaos lord in Battle Network 5, and all the side beast chips in Battle Network 6. Make them unlockable or put them in as lotto codes. For base for BN1, I'm not sure how they incorporate that unless they make it obtainable through the base fight or from an NPC as a gift after you've collected Life Aura, since that's the battle chip that base normally gives you. As for cool extras, I mentioned this in my full thoughts video, but maybe they're going to give us the movie Program of Light and Darkness, but English dubbed? Since Andrew Francis, the voice actor for Mega Man EXE from the anime, said that he's been requested to reprise the role? Not holding my breath, but we'll find out soon enough. Hopefully more info will be revealed on September 15th. On to our next question, from The Venom Spino. What is your favorite Mega Man game from each series? Who is your favorite character from each series? 
Favorite games, let's see. For the classic series, my favorite game would have to be Mega Man and Base. And that's more or less primarily because I was an SNES kid, so the graphical style of the Super Nintendo appealed to me more than the 8-bit of the NES games. Mega Man and Base was also the first classic game that I played outside of the Game Boy games. The Game Boy games are great, too. I need to finish playing the rest of the series. I beat the snot out of Mega Man 2 for Game Boy more times than I can count. I really should finish the rest of the classic series in general. Like I've stated before, I haven't spent as much time on classic as the other series. Favorite classic character? That's kind of a hard one since the majority of the classic series isn't really centered around storytelling, but as far as designs go, I think that my favorite robot master is probably Magic Man. I love classic Magic Man, and he's one of the few characters that I think actually got a downgrade when it comes to the EXE games, but that's just me personally. Favorite X game? Oh, this is a tough one. It's always been a toss-up between X1 and X5. X4 is great, and I know it's the fan favorite, but I've always liked X5 better because of the story narrative and the fact that you actually get to fight X as Zero. Plus, all the throwbacks to the previous games during the final stages are always greatly appreciated. But X1 was the start of it all, and to a certain extent, it's more or less an example of what could be called a perfect game. Perfect difficulty, great theming, just enough story to keep you very invested but not slow down the gameplay. The gameplay itself is an improvement from the classic series with all the new options that are available to you. It's just an overall excellent game. If I had to pick between them though, I think I'd pick X5 because of the alternate story paths and the fact that this would have been an excellent place to end off the X series and then go into the Mega Man Zero series if they had stuck with what they originally had intended. My favorite character from the X series? Vile. Vile is super underutilized in the games, and he's another character that I wish we could have seen in the EXE series. Axel used to be my favorite because of Command Mission, but I really grew an attachment to Vile after playing through Maverick Hunter several times. For the Legends series, I'll have to get back to you on this one. Ryo and I are working on playing Legends 2 right now, and then we'll play Misadventures of Tron Bon afterwards, so I've only beaten Legends 1 currently. For the Zero games, I think Zero 2 is my favorite. I think that it innovated just enough from the first game without making things overly complicated, but I will admit that the difficulty when it comes to trying to get EX skills and higher ranks is extremely high. I really like the story behind Zero 2 as well. I think El Pizzo is an interesting character, and the whole setup of conflicting ideologies between him and Zero and Seal is a really good and interesting dynamic. Zero and Seal want peace between the humans and Reploids, whereas El Pizzo has the mindset of us or them, similar to how Sigma did, but the situation is completely different. In this world, Reploids are in danger of being exterminated if they step out of line, so the Resistance lives in constant fear of attacks from Neo Arcadia. It's great storytelling, and it reinforces the idea that not everything is black and white, and I've always loved stories like this. But Zero 3 does have a better final boss battle because of Omega Zero. My favorite Zero series character is Fighting Fefnir, because he's basically a Reploid with Heat Guts style. Sometimes I like my characters deep and complex, sometimes I just like things simple. For the EXE series, this is probably the hardest one to pick a favorite. I do plan to do a full series retrospective and breakdown, talking about each of the game's individual strengths and weaknesses, so I'll keep this one a bit brief. I should openly state, though, that favorite and best are two entirely different things, so keep that in mind. For favorite, I think I'll say Battle Network 2 simply for nostalgia's sake. This is the first one that I actually owned, and I love most of the gameplay mechanics. I feel like it kind of standardized the combat flow as well. You know how in Battle Network 1, some battle chips would make certain bosses flinch and give them invincibility frames, but that didn't work on every boss? That was more or less fixed in Battle Network 2, where most attacks were split into a simple yes or no when it comes to flinching and iframes. There are some exceptions, but this rule is applicable to most of the bosses, starting with Battle Network 2. Favorite character? Laser Man. I love everything about this character. His design, his role, his boss fight, his setting during the story, it's all great. Easily my favorite Navi. But recently, I have been growing a bit of an attachment to Video Man as well, mostly because of the anime. I haven't really played down the Star Force games in a very, very long time, but from what I remember, I think I like Star Force 2 the best, specifically Saurian version. This was most likely because this was the introduction of Rogue, who was more or less the base of this series. I really liked the Tribe On system, and I loved the story setup, since the whole concept of the ancient advanced civilizations seemed kind of like a sequel to the Inti Warrior manga, where Pharaoh Man mentions that he's been around for 20,000 years. I plan to replay the Star Force series in its entirety, since I've only played Star Force 1 Pegasus, Star Force 2 Saurian, and Star Force 3 Black Ace, so I really need to play the entire series before I settle on an absolute favorite. Favorite character? Rogue. Edgy Edgelord is edgy. So, for some games, I think I had a really good reason, and others, not as much, but that's what I have for you at the moment. Great topic, though, Venom. And our last question comes from EasyBreezy420. 
So, do you think that Mega Man at the end of Battle Network 3 is just a Sir clone of the original? Like, all the same memories with the same emotions and drive, but doesn't actually have a soul, hence why he can now soul cross with other navvies? He's now fully data, but he just doesn't realize it. And before you ask, I know Grandpa Santa found his junk data and gave it to Lance's dad to remake Mega Man, but maybe, just maybe, he didn't want to admit that Hub was lost and he could only clone him? I mean, it might not make sense because of Mega Man Battle Network 5 and the whole ending to Nebula Grey, but it's good food for thought. This is basically asking whether or not I think that when Mega Man was revived at the end of Battle Network 3, that it's still Hub in there, or it's just a completely fabricated data clone and no longer carries Hub's soul. You honestly kind of answered the question for me. The finale of Battle Network 5, where Lan is able to reconnect to Hub while Soulnet is activated, more or less confirms that Hub is still alive and well within Mega Man's code. The only thing I will say is that you phrased the situation as, he's now fully data. I was always under the impression that he's always been fully data. The DNA was digitized in a similar way to how Tadashi Akari came up with the hypothesis of digitizing souls, which is a lot more difficult since a soul, as far as I'm aware, is an ethereal thing. A soul doesn't really have a physical form and is more conceptual. I suppose a more accurate or scientific way to phrase digitizing the soul would be to say that the thought processes and personality of people can be digitized, like brain function, etc. Why am I trying to bring science into this? It's a video game where ghosts can exist in the internet and internet people can come into the real world. But circling back around, Mega Man was always completely data, but the data was more or less built from the blueprint of Hub's DNA, if I understand how this works. I've used this reference before, but think the AI is from Halo. Smart AI like Cortana are based on the neural structure of a human brain, and sometimes they inherit the personality and traits of the donor. So digitizing the brain isn't exactly them literally turning the brain into digital matter, but rather they wrote code using the brain and its functions as a template, if I understand correctly. I'm not super well versed in the extended Halo lore, but I recently did read through a few of the books, including Fall of Reach, and I think that's how they explained it. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. So, digitizing a soul is along the same veins as pulse transmission for Battle Network 3, I would say. Because the brain operates by electrical impulses, the machine reads the brain waves, and that's how human minds can manifest in the cyber world. So, imagine if you will, that a data avatar projected by a human brain can be copied and then implanted into a Navi's shell. That is how I think Hub actually exists, at least as far as his mind and soul are concerned. Whenever they talk about the idea of digitizing souls and DNA, they always use very vague terms, so I'm just trying to justify it with the context clues I've been given. So, short answer, I think that Mega Man is still Hub because that's how they beat Nebula Grey. I will say that I think that if it hadn't been for Battle Network 5, this question would have a lot more weight to it, because Hub wasn't even mentioned in Battle Network 4, I don't think, and every time Lan tried to use his connection to Hub to snap Mega Man out of his Cybeast Rampage, I don't recall it ever actually working. Iris had to intervene when Mega Man was in the real world, and every other time, some other Navi had to beat Mega Man into submission to bring him back to his senses. We also have to think about Hub Batch. We got Hub style in Battle Network 2, but not in Battle Network 3. In Battle Network 3 and 4, Hub Batch was a Navi customizer part used to awaken Hub, and it was also a Giga Chip in Battle Network 6, but it's nowhere to be seen in Battle Network 5 as far as I remember. I should also state that in Battle Network 3, it's only accessible in the secret area, which is the post-game, and definitely takes place after the battle with Alpha. So maybe this Mega Man is just a data shell, so Lan has to reinstall Hub Batch in order to make him Hub again? What if when Lan found Hub Batch in Battle Network 3 and 4, it permanently became installed into Mega Man, which is why he doesn't need to use it in Battle Network 5? I may be reading way too deeply into things, but I like to play Devil's Advocate, so I'm open to alternate viewpoints on this. Heck, if I can try to justify Silverfist Navi being Iron Man for Battle Network 2, then I really don't think that this is too far-fetched. So, that was our first Q&A session. Thank you all for your wonderful questions, and if you have a question that you would like answered, then write a comment with at FlashingBlades Q&A, and then state your question. Now for a project announcement. I've actually been planning this one for several months. I thought it would be fun to do a mental recap of the entire Mega Man Battle Network game series. Basically, I'll be giving a play-by-play -play of the game's story, plot, bosses, notable enemies, new mechanics, etc. completely from memory. Some of these games I've not played in over 7 years, so I want to see how well I remember them. I wrote the script for the first recap on April 30th, and so far I finished scripts for Battle Networks 1 through 3, Network Transmission, and Battleship Challenge. I'm in the middle of working on my script for Battle Network 4 right now. As of this video, my progress is currently at the Theme Park Tournament. So after I finish these, I'll record gameplay, and then we'll see how well my mental recap goes. I would like to get all these done and posted before the Battle Network Legacy Collection comes out, but I'm not sure if I can get all those videos up by then, especially since we don't have a concrete release date yet. Just know that this has been in the works for months, and I'm really looking forward to seeing these come to fruition. 
For those curious, I'm not choosing to prioritize this series over the Iceberg videos. I actually work on the script for these videos while I'm not busy during my day job. Yeah, the real reason my content is so slow is because capitalism. Gotta pay that mortgage somehow. So again, if you have any questions, just ask below. Again, that's at Flashing Blades Q&A. This has been Blade Cross EXE with Flashing Blades Productions. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace out. Thank you.